Good evening and thanks for joining us tonight on your Monday. I'm Sophie Erber. Governor Pete Ricketts today said that things are back to normal. This before signing several executive orders that eliminated many of the state's COVID-19 measures that were still in place. What's changing now in our top story at five? These changes were made after Pete Ricketts said that the state reached its lowest number of hospitalizations since the state started keeping track. That number tonight stands at 73, which equates to roughly 2% of the state's total number of hospital beds. Ricketts is encouraging Nebraskans to get vaccinated, and he acknowledged all they've done well during this pandemic. As we move forward together, I want to thank all Nebraskans for what they have done over the last 15 months, the sacrifices they have made to be able to help slow the spread of the virus, preserve our hospital capacity, and help us live a more normal life. Now it's time to return to normalcy. Nebraska will be withdrawing from the federal pandemic unemployment supplemental compensation, pandemic unemployment assistance, pandemic emergency unemployment compensation, and mixed earner unemployment compensation. And now that Governor Pete Ricketts is ending those seven executive orders related to the pandemic, Siolanders, of course, have less restrictions when going out. Governor Ricketts said that he's encouraging all Nebraska to move forward together. Siolanders now will not have to wear masks while inside Nebraska establishments, and social distancing and capacity limits will not be in effect, much like in Iowa. And some are encouraged by the end of the pandemic-related executive orders. I'm very happy that the mass restrictions are being lifted and we're finally going back to whatever is the new definition of normal and hopefully life will hopefully move back on track. Coming up tonight at 10, KCAU 9's Jason Toktajian brings us reactions from Siouxland businesses and consumers about these end of directed health measures. And some good news tonight, people who have been fully vaccinated against the virus no longer have to be tested, according to the Centers for Disease Control. The CDC now says most people who have been fully vaccinated no longer need to be screened for the virus, even if they were exposed to someone who was infected. Experts say the change reflects a new reality in which nearly half of Americans have received at least one shot of the vaccine. While vaccinated people can still catch the virus, they do face little risk of serious illness from it. Today, Uber launched its COVID-19 vaccine rides program in partnership with the White House. It's offering all Americans up to a $25 discount for each of their trips to and from a vaccination site. Customers who have booked a vaccine appointment can request their ride through the Uber app. Drivers will still receive the full payment for the trip. Two weeks ago, President Joe Biden announced the partnership with Uber and its rival Lyft in an effort to boost COVID-19 vaccination rates. Meanwhile, here in Siouxland, the search for an 11-year-old Nebraska boy with autism who has been missing since last week continues. The focus now on a lake and surrounding park in the Omaha suburb of La Vista. Ryan Larson has been missing since he walked out of his elementary school. That was on May 17th in La Vista. On Sunday, authorities lowered the lake at Walnut Creek Recreation Area by several feet to help searchers get a better view of what lies along that shore. Debris in the lake, including tires and tree limbs, has hindered their search efforts. Authorities say Larson has been diagnosed with autism and that he has a history of running away from home, but he's never been away for this long. A small village in the Sioux County area is facing uncertain times tonight. After the mayor of Chatsworth resigned her position in December of last year, the town was forced to appoint a mayor pro term and plan a special election coming up on May 25th. Now, no one in the town of 80 has volunteered to be on that ballot, forcing a write-in election for the position. If the winner of the write-in refuses, the town would have to appoint a new mayor pro tem or lose their status as a town and thus be reincorporated and under county control. It's time tonight for our first check on the weather. Meteorologist Marcus Beasley standing by and Marcus just judging from all of that orange on your screen, another warm day here in Siouxland. 
That's right, Sophie. We've had those clouds, but that did not stop those temperatures from warming up into the upper 70s and lower 80s today throughout much of Siouxland, reaching up to an even 80 degrees here in Sioux City, 81 in Cherokee, 82 in Storm Lake and Denison today. A little cooler in western Siouxland, 77 for your high temperature in Wayne, 75 in North Fork Yankton with a high of 78. Overnight tonight, we'll see those temperatures drop into the low to mid 60s, a fairly comfortable night tonight. A few scattered thunderstorms possible, maybe a severe storm or two as well, likely. It does look like the rest of the week we are going to see the heat, at least for the next few days, with a cool down at the end of the week. Details on all of that in the 9 on 9 forecast. Sophie? Thanks, Marcus. Well, there's no surer sign of summer around here than the water flowing at Sioux City's splash pads. The city has officially announced those splash pads will open to the public this Saturday. The Riverside Family Aquatic Center will also open up this weekend, but will not officially be open for the season until the following week and then run through August 15th. Meanwhile, Leif Erickson Pool and Lewis Pool will open for the season on Saturday, June 12th. They remain open through August 8th. The trial of the man accused of killing Molly Tibbetts entered its second week today as the prosecution continues to make its case against Christian Rivera, a 26-year-old charged with first-degree murder now. This morning, an agent with the Department of Criminal Investigations took the stand. He was questioned on how they conducted their investigation and who exactly they interviewed. There are red flags uh, or half circles that are on the map. What do those represent? Those would uh, represent uh, areas or houses that we would have made contact. Okay. So were you going farmhouse to farmhouse trying to get any information concerning the whereabouts of Molly Tibbetts? Yes, we were. Um, I, I Agent Valletta also shared the moment his team found out Bahena Rivera was a suspect in that case. The defense then questioned Valletta about other possible suspects in the case, including one who had a violent history. Meanwhile, a woman who worked at a federal credit union in Denison has pled guilty to embezzling more than a million dollars. According to court documents, Janine Keim pled guilty to making false statements. This as part of a plea agreement in U.S. District Court this morning. Keim worked at Consumers Credit Union, or CCU, in Denison, where she embezzled more than $1.4 million. She was the second to plead guilty in this credit union issue. Brenda Jensen pled guilty for the same case back in October. A Sioux City man is facing charges tonight after police say he started his neighbor's house on fire because they would not mow his lawn. According to court documents, 53-year-old Lee Bowman confronted his neighbors on Sunday this after they failed to mow his yard the day before. A short time later, fire crews were called out to the home and investigators found that sticks and plywood propped up against that house had been set on fire using gasoline. Authorities say they were able to track those materials back to Bowman's home. Tonight, he's charged with arson and is being held in the Woodbury County Jail on a $20,000 bond. A Siouxland man was treated for smoke inhalation following a Sunday night house fire in Lamar's. Fire crews were called out to 326 Plymouth Street just after 8 at night. Light smoke was seen coming from the attic windows. The cause of that fire was determined to be electrical in nature due to an AC unit malfunction. The fire burned wiring and attic insulation. Firefighters removed that burning insulation by hand and with buckets, and they extinguished it from the outside. There was an estimated $3,600 in damage. The age at which you should get screened for colon cancer has changed tonight. Medical experts say those screenings should now start at age 45, not at age 50. The reason for the change? The medical community has seen a 2% increase in colon cancer in people under the age of 50. Doctors also say they've seen an overall decrease in the number of people getting screened over the past year. We're really encouraging people to get back to their routine screening protocol meaning get back into screening because the risk of screening, the risk of getting COVID from screening is way less than the risk of letting a cancer be advanced over time. So everybody should be back to screening. Screening is safe, screening is effective. Those who are wishing to schedule a cancer screening should consult their primary care physician to set up an appointment. A high school student in Chicago is being honored tonight for his work on South Dakota's Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. The nonprofit Buddy's Helpers honored Jackson Moran for his efforts off the field. 
Moran works with the nonprofit Remember to help people living on the Pine Ridge Reservation. It's home to the poorest county in the country. He's built outhouses, bunk beds, and even wheelchair ramps there. When COVID-19 kept him from traveling there physically, he started riding his bike to raise money. I'm honored. I'm grateful for the support that I've had. Uh, I couldn't have raised over $5,000 without it. Um, I'm thankful for my aunt and uncle who took me out to remember for the first time six years ago now and how blessed I am to have it be a part of my life. And last summer, Jackson raised more than $5,000 for that organization that, of course, funds volunteer work on the reservation. And just a quick note from us here, KCAU 9 News will be off the air tomorrow between 9 in the morning until 4 p.m. due to repairs to our transmitter. We do hope you'll still join us for our newscasts at 5 and 6 p.m. Well, they haven't seen each other for 50 years, but thanks to the Internet, this family was reunited. And we'll bring you their story out of Sioux Falls coming up. And it's looking like scattered thunderstorms possible tonight. Drier air will begin to work into the area and we will cool off soon. Details on all of that after the break. You're watching KCAU 9 News with Sophie Erber and meteorologist Marcus Beasley. This is KCAU 9 News at 5. Stay in the mid to upper 70s, so uh, some cooler weather in the forecast, especially if you're... Um, you don't like the heat that we've had here the last few days. I never mind heat. Uh, it's humidity that mm -hmm. I think gets to everybody. So and it does look like that humidity is going to lessen a bit for the middle to the end of the week as well. Great news there. All right. Thanks a lot, Marcus. Well, lawmakers in our nation's capital listening to budget requests for the United States space programs. Why advocates say it's so important coming up. But first, a Sioux Falls family reunited after decades apart. This touching tale of adoption after the break. A Sioux Falls mom and daughter reunited after mom said goodbye to her newborn five decades ago. Reporter Lauren Sulek tells you this adoption story and how the internet reconnected them. There they come. This is a moment for which Marla's hand has been waiting for 56 years. A chance for mother and daughter to be together again. Oh, and there she is. Oh, finally. <laughs> oh, I love you too. We finally get to meet. 56 years ago, at the age of 16, Marla's hand became pregnant with a baby girl. I had a tough decision to make. I was still living at home. And I knew it would really burden my parents, who were older. But I also wanted her to have a mother and a father. Um, I didn't even let the father know. He was in the service and he never contacted me after he went back. So she got help from Lutheran Social Services to find a new family for her daughter. I've always wondered where she is, where she was and how she was doing. Um, I would have gotten, given anything to find her. But I didn't feel that was right of me since I let her be adopted at birth. Diana Brown grew up in Dallas, South Dakota, but has been living in Kansas. I've always wondered about what she looked like and, you know, but I, ha I did have a wonderful family. She did a good thing by me. For her birthday, she asked her husband for an Ancestry.com subscription. That's how she found her biological mom. I actually got in contact with her sister's grandson, right? Right. And he uh, contacted her, and then we and then started talking. Went from there. They were reconnected in March of this year, and today Brown made the drive to Sioux Falls from Kansas to finally meet her mom in person. I'm just so happy to see I her. I am too. <laughs> Well, focusing on space, outer space that is, it's a topic of budget debate on Capitol Hill and why lawmakers say funding space programs is a dire need after this break. Earlier today, lawmakers held a hearing to go over the 2022 budget request for space programs. Witnesses say there's a dire need for the U.S. to work harder in space. Our Washington correspondent Basil John explains. This is one of the most important topics, perhaps besides nuclear modernization, that, that we're dealing with. Monday, members of the House Armed Services Committee heard about the challenges facing the nation's space programs. We now see um, threats 
to space from the ground, threats to space in space. We think we see in the future, maybe threats from the ground from space. Ohio Republican Congressman Michael Turner, as well as Tennessee Democratic Congressman Jim Cooper agree, the country needs to be competitive in space. We need uh, to be able to field systems that work and field them faster. Those who testified said the space program's biggest threat are the separate programs from foreign countries. The growth of Chinese and Russian counter space capabilities presents the most immediate and serious threats to U.S., allied and partner space activities. Space Policy Assistant Defense Secretary John Hill says China and Russia view space as critical to modern warfare. The United States must now be prepared for conflict to extend to or even originate in space. U.S. Space Force Vice Chief of Space Operations General David Thompson says the U.S. is already working to make sure the country doesn't fall behind. Strengthening relationships with existing partners and establishing relationships with new partners. But both Hill and Thompson agree the U.S. needs to move faster to compete. Reporting in Washington, I'm Basil John. Taking a live look outside right now in Orange City, Marcus returns with one more check on your forecast. Stay with us. Just one more quick reminder, uh, KCAU will be off the air tomorrow between 9 in the morning until 4 in the afternoon. We're doing some repairs on our transmitter, so we hope you'll still join us later on here for this 5 o'clock and our 6 o'clock newscast mm -hmm. and a quick check on our weather overnight. Yeah, it's going to be a warm night temperature-wise in the lower 60s. We are going to have some scattered showers and storms, maybe a severe storm.